Hi, I'm Christian. I've been around the community for a few years now, and some of you may know me from the work on ZRipple. And this summer I graduated uh, from university and I joined Nutanix to work on the Nutanix Files product. But today I'll talk about what I did in my master's thesis, uh, where I looked at how we can make the ZIL faster so that it can keep up with persistent memory. But before we come to that, let's have a short recap on the ZIL's role in the larger ZFS architecture. As most of you are probably aware, the ZFS on disk structure is a tree of block pointers. And whenever we want to update a file in that structure, we are going to modify a leaf block within an object. And um, since the block pointers check some they're pointy, we have to propagate the change up to the up the tree up to the Uber block. And to make all of this crash safe, ZFS uses a copy on write mechanism. So as a concrete example, if we modify a level zero block and we'd actually allocate a new level zero block that contains our changes, and then we would need to modify the block pointer for that block in the parent level one indirect block over here to point to that new allocated block. And so we don't modify that block in place, but create a copy of that block again. But this time we reuse most of the block pointers except for the block that we just modified. And this will go on up to the Uber block and uh, once the new Uber block has been written, it's the new root of the oldest tree structure and some parts of the old tree are now obsolete and we can get rid of them. Now, uh, this is quite beautiful to look at in an, on itself, but we can't really afford to do this dance for every single VFS operation. It would just be prohibitively expensive, both in terms of uh, CPU time and write amplification. Uh, the solution that ZFS takes is to batch the changes of many BFS operations into transaction groups. And by batching these, uh, we will amortize the cost uh, for this full bottom-up update. Um, however, with these transaction groups, we just got ourselves a new problem. Because to make the batching work, we must wait for changes to accumulate in DRAM. But at the same time, it's not reasonable to block every VFS operation that happens until the batch is large enough so um, what we do is we let the VFS operation return to user space immediately and the TXG will then be written out in the background. Uh, the advantage of this is that all the VFS operations now operate at CPU or DRAM speed and the change, the downside is that the change will only be durable eventually. And there's not really a hard guarantee on when that will be or whether that will ever happen or the ordering uh, in which that will happen. And some apps just need that to function properly. Uh, for example, apps like databases uh, need a mechanism for fast and immediate durability for the files that they modify. So they, they just can't wait for the current open transaction group to sync out because uh, in the end, there's a human waiting at the other end of the line. So the solution that ZFS takes for this is the ZIL. The idea is to um, extend the on-disk structure um, with a linked list head for each object set. And the nodes on the list uh, that starts there are self-checksumming. And that means that we can append to the list independent of the transaction groups uh, being synced because we don't need to update any parent block pointers uh, that point to these nodes because they are self-checksumming. Now, when a VFS operation needs immediate durability, it will append a log record to that list that describes what happened in that operation at the logical level. And if everything goes well and the system doesn't crash, then the change is going to be written out in a transaction group as an update to the on disk tree. And um, as part of the new transaction group, we write out a new list head that pops off all those log records from the list that are now obsolete because they are part of the tree structure proper. But what happens if we crash before we finish writing our transaction group five? In that case, the pool is in the state of transaction group four plus the log records that were written to the chain since then. And what we are going to do once we reboot is that we re-import the pool and then we remind the block allocator that we actually handed out those log blocks for use by the ZIL. And this phase is called claiming. And later, once we get around to mounting the file system, we can then walk the chain of log records and reapply each log record uh, to the data set. And the end result will be that the file system state, uh, once we're done with this, contains all the changes that we promised as durable before the system crashed. And we can then mount the data set and let the application observe its state. Now, uh, things are 
not as simple as that in reality. There are a bunch of complications and I'm going to limit myself to the two important aspects uh, that are relevant for this talk. The first is LWBs. Uh, the ZIL actually doesn't write individual log records, but it batches them together into so-called log write blocks. And uh, so this linked list is actually not a linked list of records, but it's a linked list of LWBs. On blocks, uh, we need those LWBs uh, for block alignment and um, uh, because the, the log records themselves have variable length as indicated in this sketch here. And also the, the batching can be used and the batching of multiple log records into LWBs can be used uh, to do some tricks on high latency hardware to make the to make this a little a little less expensive. Uh, the second thing uh, that uh, complicate things are ITXs. The VFS operations uh, actually don't write the log records directly to the on-disk list because often the VFS operation doesn't even know whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. This is determined later when we call fsync. So instead, the VFS operation only creates DRAM log records, uh, which we call intent log transactions or short ITXs. And after creating those ITXs, the VFS operation will hand those ITXs over to the ZIL uh, using the ZIL ITX assign API, and then the ZIL keeps track of those ITXs internally. And when user space actually does request immediate persistence, for example, through sync or fsync, then the ZFS POSIX layer calls another ZIL API called ZIL commit. And the ZIL commit's job is to figure out which ITXs need to be written out to the on disk log as log records so that they are, uh, so that the semantics of the system call are actually met. Great, so um, we've covered the very basics of the ZIL. Now let's talk about ZIL performance on modern hardware. Uh, the basic principle is that the latency for synchronous I.O. operations is the time that is spent on doing the, ZF, uh, the VFS work plus the time that is spent on the ITX assign and the commit. Now, um, VFS and the ITX assign are purely CPU and DRAM bound, but the commit is a little more complicated. It does the work of figuring out which ITXs need to be written out to disk. So that's building the ZIL commit list, and then it has to take those ITXs from the commit list, convert them into log records, and pack them into LWBs. And uh, then it uses the ZIO pipeline to write out those LWBs to the actual storage hardware. Now, and all of these are software steps uh, that add overhead to the actual hardware latency uh, for each LWB that is written. And historically, uh, software overhead wasn't really a problem because the hardware latency dominated every other component in this equation. But with modern hardware, for example, the 3D crosspoint stuff for, uh, that is used in the Optane, NVMe, and PMEM drives, uh, we get single-digit microsecond latencies for 4K synchronous random writes. And this means that even a few microseconds of processing time can easily become the bottleneck uh, for the performance. And we can actually observe this by configuring uh, Optane PMEM as a slot device with today's ZIL. And uh, in that experiment that we did here, we used uh, FIO to generate 4K synchronous random writes onto a Z pool with separate data sets for each FIO thread. And then uh, the pool had three enterprise NVMe drives configured as top level VDEVs, so plenty of uh, IO throughput uh, performance, and a single PMEM DIM configured as a slog device. Now, what we measured was the work clock time that was spent in each of the latency components. And what we could observe is that the vast majority of the time that is spent per IOP goes to LWB and ZIO overheads. Only about 20% of the time are spent on DMU and ITX work, and only 14% of the work clock time are spent on the actual um, interaction with the hardware and waiting for the hardware to store the data. And uh, if we look at the like what is being written to the disk, we could also observe that the LWBs are actually suboptimally sized. There's uh, about three times write amplification going on per certain write. Um, so the, the LWBs that we're actually writing out are 12 kilobytes in size, whereas the actual payload is little more than four kilobytes. So uh, there's a lot more nuance to this analysis that I'm not really able to present here due to time constraints. And it's also certainly not a workload that is representative of every use case for ZFS, but it's a good example for what is wrong with the current ZIL and why I believe we should uh, re-architect the ZIL for modern hardware. 
And to summarize, like there, there were two conclusions that I drew from this experiment. The first was that batching log records into AWBs is not necessary, at least not always. Uh, on PMEM, which is byte addressable, we don't need to adhere to the block boundaries. And like even if we do, because we are on NVMe drives, for example, uh, tricks like the, the batching and AWB timeout and all that stuff that we do uh, for for high latency storage hardware doesn't really buy us a latency advantage anymore. It's more of an overhead at this point. The second conclusion is that the ZIO pipeline adds much overhead for very little benefit. The problem is that all the connect switching that's going on in there adds latency and latency noise, latency jitter, and most likely it's also not particularly helpful for data locality. Essentially, the entire design is more geared toward high throughput than latency. So given these observations, I think that the a new ZIL design is needed and it should have the following properties. First, it should abandon LWBs as a concept and store individual log records instead. It may or may not do some batching under the hood to optimize things, but to get the lowest latency for fully synchronous workloads, we should just store individual log records. Second, we should no longer have pointer chains on disk like we do with the LWBs today. Instead, we should defer the serialization work, at least of the IO operations, as much as possible to the time of replay. And this will enable more parallelism on the right path for independent operations. And third, we should uh, bypass the ZIO pipeline to avoid its overheads and write directly to the storage hardware instead. Uh, we have seen the benefits of direct access to NVMe drives last year in Saji Nair's presentation, and we'll see later that they are even greater if we apply this to PMEM. So given these goals, I now present uh, my proposal on how we can actually achieve them. Uh, the main architectural change that I'm introducing is that we should use the slog VDEVs in a different way. Um, we don't give the slog VDEV space to the SPA, but instead we let the ZIL consume the space of the hardware directly. And the ZIL then constructs a storage substrate on top of it, and that is used to store all the log records of all data sets in the pool. And that storage substrate behaves like an unordered set of log records. You can put records into it and you can iterate over it in an arbitrary order and it will automatically garbage collect itself in the background to avoid running out of space. And we'll use the, the log records last sync transaction group to determine which log records need to be garbage collected. And on top of this very, very minimal interface, uh, we then implement the actual ZIL functionality. The idea is that each data set adds a bunch of metadata to each log record. And if we should actually crash, the replay code will then use that metadata to figure out which records need to be replayed and in what order. Uh, here's a quick visualization. So at the time we write the ZIL, ZIL commit will be writing the log records in some logical order, but the storage substrate is free to organize this log space however it sees fit. Um, so it just has to ensure that it will find those log records again if we crash. And while we are writing uh, new log, rec log records, uh, the garbage collection will kick in in the background. And um, yeah, this will just be how the thing operates all the time. And we hope that there is free space uh, on the physical level at all times. Now let's assume that we crash. Then uh, the replay code will scan through the storage substrate's contents uh, to find records of the data set in question. It will filter out obsolete log records and then reconstruct the replay sequence. And that replay sequence is then applied to the data set to recover the committed state, just as it is, as it is with, the, with the current ZIL today. And if the storage substrate detects that, uh, if the storage substrate loses some log records, for example, due to bit rot or data corruption, then the replay algorithm will have to deal with the fact that those log records won't show up when it scans the storage substrate. So data integrity is also covered here. Uh, so why is this more performant? There are two main reasons. Uh, the first is that we've eliminated write after write dependencies on the IO path for independent writes. Of course, like if the writes actually depend on each other, they must have a mechanism to wait on each other so that replay can succeed but at least we have the option to do independent writes in fully in parallel now. The second advantage is that the storage substrate is just an interface. And this enables us to have a custom lightweight implementation that is specialized to the particular storage stack at hand and to the particular hardware. Uh, so for example, uh, for PMEM, I implemented a custom 
allocation scheme and a data layout that is optimized for the ZIL contents. And I use PMM native IO instead of using the ZIO pipeline. So um, now that I've established the high level idea, let's make things a little more concrete with an example. What we are seeing here is a visualization of the storage substrate's contents and the metadata of each log record. On the x-axis, we have the generation number and we use it to encode logical dependencies between records. On the y-axis, we have the transaction group of the individual records. And the name of the records, um, which we, for which we use a, a letter right here, is also a piece of metadata. It identifies the entry uniquely within a generation. And for clarity, we are using unique names for the entire, for all log records in this example here. So at the beginning of our example, the source substrate was empty. And now we've added a log record, uh, which we call A, and it's for a change in transaction group four in generation 11. And now we write another record uh, for transaction group five in generation 12. And this record is called B and its generation is higher than A. So um, this expresses a replay dependency uh, of B onto A right here. Um, then we write another record uh, C into the next generation 13. And while we are writing new records, garbage collection might kick in in the background and remove records for transaction group four because transaction group four has been synced in the background. So um, uh, this will happen, but the garbage collection is fully independent of the write path. So even while garbage collection is going on, we are still writing another record D. And D is actually for the same generation as C. This is new. And what we've expressed here is that D has a replay dependency on B, just like C does, but D does not depend on C for replay. Um, now we continue to write records uh, E and F, which also share the same generation number 14. So E and F don't depend on each other, but E and F both depend on C and D for replay. And finally, we'll write records G and H into a new generation and, and also starting some, some new TXGs. So um, the number is going up there. Note that at this point, we can uh, observe that garbage collection is going to kick in pretty soon because at any given point, there can only be three unsynced transaction groups. So at this point, it's clear that transaction group five has synced out because otherwise there wouldn't be a, an entry for a log record for transaction group eight. So now let's recap and see what metadata we've observed here. We have seen the transaction group, we have seen, have seen the um, generation numbers, and we have seen uh, the unique IDs for each entry, which are represent by the, the, represented by the letters. However, this is not really sufficient to uh, detect lost entries at replay time. Um, so uh, for this, we use a counter per transaction group that, um, and to explain how these are computed, we're gonna run through the example again and show uh, which, which counters uh, each individual log record has. So uh, for the records of the first generation, all the counters are set to zero. And after we are done writing a generation, we sum up how many records were written in each transaction group. And this running sum is kept in a table called the counters table. Now, uh, for the next generation's records, we will then use the counters table's contents uh, as the counter values for um, each individual log record over here. So we can see this with N3B. We've copied the table into the entry B. And now again, after B, uh, after B's generation, so generation 12 is done, we um, do the accounting and account for the fact that we have written another uh, log record in transaction group five. Uh, remember, this is a running sum so uh, we don't reset the table after a generation. Now, if there are multiple records in a generation, like generation 13, we use the same table in every record of that generation, uh, because uh, as we'll see later, these don't depend on each other, so um, they only depend on the, on the last generation and every generation before it. Um, so again, we just copy over the table, and at the end of the generation, we account for the records written, and this time we've written two records, so we have to bump two counters here. Um, now, uh, and this this will be, like again, it's the same procedure for generation 14. We do the accounting again, and we write records for generation 15. And now, there's one interesting property here. Um, the table that we store for generation 15 only, uh, contains the counters for transaction groups eight, seven, and six. So we've dropped the counters for transaction group five and four, 
And the reason is that we know that these have synced, so we know that we won't have to validate the counters later during replay. Okay, uh, so um, we've seen how the counters are computed. Let's now put them to use uh, to exercise the, the replay code path. Uh, let's assume that we crashed after we've written out transaction group five, uh, but before it was garbage collected. Then um, uh, in that case, the, the records that need replay are the records D, F, G, and H. We ignore B and E, uh, even though they are still present, um, because their change is already part of the main data structure. And if we attempted to replay them, the replay callback would fail because the replay actions that are encoded in these log records are not idempotent. So our plan is to replay D, F, G, and H, and then use the counters to detect lost records along the way. Uh, let's first cover the happy case where we haven't lost any record. In that case, we uh, so we initialize our counters table to zero uh, during replay, and then look for the first records counters. And uh, for each counter, that is greater than the transaction group at which we crashed, the counters must match what we have in the replay table. So um, these counters are all from generations that are five or older. So there's nothing to check here and we can just replay it. And after doing the replay action, uh, we um, update the counters in our account for, for, so after we, we've replayed all entries in a generation, we update the counters table uh, just as we would do on the right path. Now moving on to F, um, the counters for transaction group five and four uh, can be ignored again, but the counter for transaction group six must match what we have in the table. And that is in fact the case. So we can replay F and we can uh, do the counting and move on to entry G. And again, we compare the counters and can observe that these match. So we can replay G as well and uh, H, we can replay that as well. Great, so that was easy. Now let's look at the case of actual data corruption. Suppose some bitroid has corrupted and records E and F, then uh, the storage substrate would not show them to us when we scan it uh, to construct the replay sequence. We wouldn't even know that they existed in the first place because the storage substrate doesn't tell us about them. So um, for now, our replay sequence is going to look like uh, D, G and H. Now uh, we want the replay algorithm, the replay algorithm to replay record D, but we mustn't replay records G or H because they depend on F, uh, courtesy of the generation numbers. So let's see how this works out. We'll initialize the counters table and compare the counters for uh, record D. Uh, they match, so or they can all be ignored, so we can replay D and do the counting. Then we move on to G and uh, the counters uh, for transaction group six don't match in this case, so we cannot replay G. Now, uh, since H has no logical dependency on G because it's in the same generation, we try to replay it as well, but uh, its counters also don't match, so we cannot replay it either. And we'll stop replay at this point because we've reached the end of our uh, tentative replay sequence. Um, and uh, the, the end result is that we've replayed as much as possible given the constraint of the, the generation numbers uh, over here. Great. Uh, and like what's important, like the, the, the important thing is that we can actually present witnesses for a missing entry uh, or for, for a missing record. So G and H serve as witnesses that record F has been missing. Uh, if this was a little too fast or you want to revisit this later, I'd encourage you to either read the chapter in the thesis or uh, look at this slide and the next because they are basically summaries of the voice track. Uh, but what we are going to focus on right now is the concrete implementation and then later on benchmarks. So the short name for this entire project was ZILPMEM and it's the product of my master's thesis. The goal of the thesis was to design a system that makes synchronous I.O. in ZFS as fast as possible using persistent memory. So this was really uh, a no compromise approach on making synchronous I.O. as fast as possible. We've already covered the high level uh, ideas and so on and the algorithms. And uh, for the rest of the talk, we are going to focus on implementation and benchmarks. And there's a bunch of uh, more material in the thesis if you're interested uh, in particular testing, validation strategy, and so on, and a lot more details about the benchmarking setup. 
Um, I've already mentioned persistent memory a couple of times, and until now it has been more or less sufficient to think of it as a very fast type of storage. But to really appreciate the the value that it brings to the table, we should have a more elaborate introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, you might know it under a different name. There is uh, non-volatile main memory or storage class memory, and these are all like this, the naming depends on which branch of industry or academia you're following. In the case of persistent memory, it's a concrete uh, product name uh, branded by Intel. So um, the, the idea is generally always the same. The idea is that um, instead of speaking a storage protocol like NVMe, uh, you map the PMEM directly into the address space and then use normal load and store instructions and maybe some cache flushes and so on to uh, perform I.O. to it. So there is no storage protocol anymore. Uh, essentially, your microarchitecture is what you use to talk to the storage directly. Um, so this is a pretty different model of doing I.O. Uh, than what we are used to in the storage space. But it has, the PMM has some very appealing properties for the ZIL that makes it worth taking a closer look. So first, it's very fast because there is less overhead than with uh, something like NVMe, even if it's the same storage media underneath. Uh, so in the case of uh, in the case of Obtain, both the Obtain NVMe drives and the Obtain PMAP drives use uh, 3D crosspoint media underneath. So basically, there's the opportunity to pass on those additional efficiency gains by avoiding the protocol overhead all the way up to the commit and make this really, really fast. Uh, the second advantage of PMEM is that it's byte addressable. This is ideal for the ZIL because the ZIL log records themselves have variable length and are often very short. So with the ZIL on PMEM, you don't really have to worry about padding or block alignment or the space wastage that might result from uh, padding up to a certain alignment. I've put some links up here if you want to learn more about the basic technology, uh, but for us and for the purpose of this talk, these are really the most important characteristics. What we haven't covered yet is how we can actually reach that hardware in uh, something like in an operating system like Linux. So um, first of all, uh, there are several operating modes for PMEM, and uh, we are going to use the app direct mode for PMEM in the FSDX configuration here. You can just ignore those details if, if you're new to the topic. What's important is that in that mode, the PMEM will show up as a block device node in the device FS. And the kernel driver that provides this device node will then implement the block device IO uh, using the PMEM native store and cache flush operations and so on. And this will enable existing block device consumers to take advantage of PMEM performance without any modification. So for example, in the experiments on ZIL performance that I presented earlier, uh, I just used the dev PMEM as a slot device with the current upstream OpenCFS. But the idea behind PMEM really is about direct byte granular and transparent access to the persistent storage. So essentially it's a full bypass of the operating system storage stack. And in order to support this, Linux provides the direct access APIs. Uh, in that case, the, the block device consumers can use these APIs to check whether the block device uh, is actually PMEM. And if that is the case, then they can establish a direct memory mapping to the PMEM. And once the mapping is established, the consumer then can issue load and store instructions and cache flushes and so on directly to that memory mapping. And the operating system is completely out of the picture. Uh, so what we, see in the, what we see in this screenshot here is an example from the EXT4 source code where uh, there is conditional optimization for PMEM uh, or a different implementation of how we read um, read and read data from a file if um, the file is actually on an exe4 instance this instance that is deployed on PMEM. Great. So given this framework, uh, the goal for the PMEM was to make it fully transparent to the user. So there should be no change in the zpool CLI because in the end, like the dev PMEM device still looks like a normal block device uh, from the user's point of view. And uh, ZFS should just switch over to the new ZIL architecture that I proposed and, um, and do the right thing if the stock is actually persistent memory. So now, how does this fit in the overall system architecture of CFS? Uh, the PMEM will be added as a slog VDEV to the zpool, and then we'll implement our new ZIL stack on top of it. Um, now we can't throw away the old ZIL code for a bunch of reasons. Um, so the first step was to refactor the ZIL so that the different persistence mechanisms uh, could coexist at runtime. And the result is that 
uh, we have this thing called zilkinds, and I'll give more details about this in a minute. After that, um, I actually implemented the, the high-level ideas that I presented earlier. If you remember, we need a storage substrate um, for PMEM and an implementation of the high-level algorithms. And the storage substrate uh, in the PMEM is called PRB. And the high-level algorithms are implemented in a code module called handle. And the data structure for this handle it exists once per uh, once per ZIL instance. Now, um, to make these data structures easier to test, uh, I implemented the PRB and handle as quite in modules. And so uh, there is some glue code necessary to integrate them into the ZFS code base. That's the yellow spot over here. And also I had to teach the VDEV layer uh, at the lower layer uh, about PMEM and initialize the PRB on top of it and so on. So there's some glue code involved there as well. And let's look at the ZIL kinds first. The idea here is to split up the ZIL code into two modules. Uh, there's the ITX module, which deals with anything that is happening in DRAM. So this would be the code that keeps track of unwritten log records, the code that figures out which records need to be written to the oldest ZIL chain during ZIL commit. And the other module uh, that I have is the persistence module. And uh, that is all the code that actually writes the ZIL to some form of stable storage, determines the, the uh, persistent data structure and so on. Uh, that code is also responsible to read the ZIL after a crash, to interpret its contents, and to drive the replay process. So now with, with this refactoring, I could then introduce a V table uh, that decouples this persistence API from the general ZIL API. And uh, like we can now have different implementations for this V table coexist at runtime. And the name for these different implementations is called ZIL kinds. So now any ZIL kind uh, we'll need some place to store information that is per data set, like the LWB list head for the ZIL LWB. And the place for this, or like, and ZIL PMEM will store some metadata in there so that it can find the log records uh, again. So um, basically, we uh, needed a place for this, and the place, the ideal place for this is the ZIL header. And so with uh, ZIL kinds, the ZIL header now becomes a tag union, and the union tag is the enum value that represents the ZIL kind. So um, this also means that when we decide, when we need to decide which V table to use at runtime, we just uh, refer to the union tag that we find in the ZIL header. Uh, this design is also backwards compatible because if the ZPool feature for ZIL kinds is not yet active, then we can just assume that the data set uses the old AWB based ZIL kind and uh, also use the old ZIL header layout. Now, I also want to spend a few minutes on the storage substrate implementation because I really think it highlights how simple that layer can be. When PRB is initialized, uh, it takes a PMAP mapping and, a partition, and it partitions it into equal sized chunks. And each of those chunks is then an append only sequence of log records. So that uh, when we want to write a record to PRB, we can just pick any record that has sufficient space and insert the log record at the tail of that sequence in a crash consistent manner. And uh, for garbage collection, we'll just wait until the chunk is full, then wait until all the entries in it are obsolete because the transaction group has zoomed out. And then we'll just reset the entire chunk uh, sequence to zero to the beginning, and then it can be filled again. And if we have a sufficient amount of chunks, then this can be a quite performant implementation. For example, we can have one open chunk per CPU so that there is no contention between parallel writers uh, for access to the chunks. And if we make the chunks large enough, then we also minimize the need to uh, coordinate different writers when they need a new chunk or when garbage collector runs and so on. And this is really all there is to it. Um, to this design, of course, there are some DRAM data structures for bookkeeping and garbage collection and so on, but these are really boring details and they don't have much overhead. The key observation is that, uh, at least for PMEM, the source substrate implementation is very, very thin, easy to understand, easy to audit, and most importantly, has very, very low overhead. Um, yeah, sorry about bullet points here. Okay. So the next step was to wire all this up into a prototype that could be used to run the actual benchmarks. If you remember, the goal was to automatically activate the PMEM when we add a PMEM stock device. And the problem with this was when the pool is already instantiated, then um, we'd have to switch over V tables while they are potentially in use. And I didn't have the time to cover this during the thesis. So the workaround was to determine the ZIL kind 
ahead of time when we create the zpool. Uh, so we have this ugly module parameter here where we, uh, when we set it to pmem, uh, to the pmem, and then create the pool, uh, we'll check that the VDEV config matches and contains exactly one uh, pmem stock device. And uh, once that's done, we set the root data sets the kind to the pmem. And now whenever we import the pool, we look at this root data set the kind and recover the pool the kind from, from that field. And um, of course, we'll, we'll check that the VDEV config still matches and then instantiate PRB on top of the PMEM stock space. And then uh, the individual ZLog T instances and then the commit routine, if you just uh, use a pointer in the spa uh, to, to access the PRB. And obviously, we also need to prevent operations like zpool remove uh, of the stock device because uh, we don't want to pull out the PMEM from underneath uh, PRB while it's still in use. So all of this is quite hacky. I will freely admit that, and it probably needs more refactoring, but it was sufficient to get the job done in the sense that we could run benchmarks on top of it. Um, now, before we come to the benchmarks, uh, let's take a quick look at how the commit works in the PMEM. Uh, the first thing is that the first thing that the commit does is that it acquires a mutex uh, that is per data set. And then it uses the ITX code to get the commit list. Then it walks over the commit list. And for each ITX on the commit list, it will uh, convert it into log record representation and then write those log records into the handle PRB data structure, so into the storage substrate. And we'll pick a new generation for each record. Um, so the at replay time, the replay dependencies are fully sequential. And this is uh, just a just exactly what the same same kind of dependencies that we have with LWBs, and uh, this was just the safest choice uh, to use here. Now, when we are done with this, we release the mutex, and uh, the next uh, commit call uh, can start can start writing can start writing. And of course, if the data sets are independent, then they only need to coordinate at the source substrate level, and we've seen that this can be made very efficient. Now, there are some some uh, points where we can improve this here. Uh, so one is to use something like the commit waiters so that we can get a little more parallelism. We can do this by pre-computing the generation ranges that will be used writer and then uh, have the writers do the writing in parallel. Um, the problem is that we'll still need, that we need to change the APIs a little under the hood. So this can be done, but just hasn't been done yet. The other thing in the thesis, and I have some backup slides on this as well, is that um, I experimented with bypass TX layer completely to enable even more parallelism than what we can have with um, uh, with, um, with the commit waiters, uh, but we don't have time to cover this here. So um, yeah, let's look at some benchmarks. Uh, we start with the primary workload of the thesis um, that were uh, 4K synchronous random writes with a separate data set per thread. Again, like I know this is not really representative for most CFS workloads, but it's surely a torture test for the ZIL. So in this experiment, I uh, compared the performance of four different configurations. Uh, the first configuration was the FS DEX configuration in uh, yellow. And uh, this configuration writes directly to the PMEM from user space. So we only have the raw hardware latency plus some syscall overhead. The uh, other three configurations were uh, ZIL AWB, ZIL PMEM, and async. Uh, they were all on a Z pool with uh, three enterprise NVMe drives and uh, one persistent memory uh, DIM SLOG device. Uh, the ZIL AWB and ZIL PMEM use the respective ZIL kinds. And the async configuration um, has sync equals disabled set. So this is meant as a like estimate for the an upper bound of how efficient the like what, what we could achieve if the zip persistence code was uh, was maximally efficient. Okay, so now look let's look at the results. Um, what we can observe is that the PMEM achieves 130,000 IOPS with a single thread, and that is this purple curve over here. And that is about an 8x speed up over what we can achieve with uh, ZIL AWB on the same hardware. It's just a software change. And uh, we can also observe that the PMEM scales up uh, fairly well uh, to 400,000 IOPS with four threads. And this is on, and this is still a 5.5x speed up over what we can achieve with uh, ZIL AWB. 
Now, um, for higher thread counts, we see it to, to align with the FS dex curve over here. And um, the, the async curve actually shoots up way higher. So what this means is that we are reaching the PMEM throughput limit at this point, and that if we had higher PMEM bandwidth available, we could increase uh, the, we, we could potentially land even higher IOPS. Uh, I actually did that experiment in the thesis and we reached about 900,000 IOPS uh, with four interleaved obtained DIMMs. So that's pretty good. Uh, if we look at the a little deeper at how the latency is distributed, uh, we can observe that the PMEM with uh, the PMEM, the ZIL persistence now only takes about 25% of the void clock time um, of each IOP, uh, whereas it, it was about 80% with the LWB based ZIL. And in turn, this means that the asynchronous part of the ZIL, so DMU and the ITX work, now become the dominant components in the latency equation, and we need to optimize there. I also did some uh, more realistic benchmarks. Most of you would probably call those still fairly academic, and I would agree, but it's really the best I had. I'm not going to go into each of those in detail. The gist is that they are all doing uh, synchronous writes in one way or another, either through write-ahead logs or um, uh, metadata-heavy sync operations and so on. And in contrast to the previous workloads, those all ran on one data set, so we can actually observe the impact of the, the mutex that is held in the commit. Uh, in the comparison between the LWB and the PMEM, I could observe that the uh, like single-threaded workloads, so um, RocksDB, Redis, and so on, they, they achieve pretty good performance, 5.8x uh, speedup over the LWB with Redis at 2.7 speedup, MariaDB at 2x speedup. Um, and there were some workloads that didn't benefit as much, but um, in general, this is a pretty good result. Um, if you crank up the scaling factor, so the number of threads that are simultaneously doing requests to these types of servers or doing put operations and so on, uh, what we could observe is that the PMEM doesn't really scale linearly. Like if it would, then the bar in the, 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 the orange bar for scaling factor four would need to be four times as high as the bar and scaling factor one. But there is still a substantial improvement, so there is some scalability there. And uh, the PMEM still performs better than the LWB in most of the workloads. The other interesting comparison is that between the PMEM and DM write cache. Uh, DM write cache is a device mapper target in the Linux kernel that you can use to uh, configure a write only cache for any block device, including other device mapper targets. And what's so appealing about this is that it has been explicitly designed for persistent memory and fast NVMe drives, um, and but it uses a different architectural approach uh, because it's a write-back cache, whereas the ZPMEM is really a write-ahead log, and um, the write cache is more of a block layer volume manager type of approach versus ZPMEM, uh, which is very tightly integrated into the ZFS5 system. So it's exciting to observe the different performance uh, of these different architectures. And what I could observe is that in the workloads that I looked at, the PMEM always lands within plus minus 30% of the throughput that could be achieved with DM write cache uh, if we put XFS on top of it. Uh, so this is good because in contrast to ZIL AWB, we can actually be a serious competitor to this technology in terms of performance. And um, uh, there are some benchmarks uh, that perform very small writes, so RocksDB and Redis. And these performed better in the previous benchmark as well, but in this one, we also see a big advantage for the PMEM here, and these, these workloads over here. Uh, and I think that the reason for this is that uh, we have less write amplification in the PMEM because um, like XFS will see a block device underneath and will blow everything, every, everything up to uh, four kilobytes, uh, whereas the PMEM will, uh, yeah, use the PMEM natively and write small log records directly. Now, um, uh, these numbers are quite impressive. Um, we should talk about some of the drawbacks of the PMEM before we wrap up, although we're running short on time, so I'll skip over th some of those. Uh, first, the prototype that I developed in the thesis has a bunch of weaknesses. Uh, in particular, um, like the, we only have one implementation of this architecture, so we don't really know whether it's a leaky abstraction. Uh, then there's a problem with uh, workloads that only do occasional AFSYNCs, F-sync operations. So we haven't really looked at those in the benchmarks. 
but there are a bunch of efficiencies, inefficiencies in the implementation, and we could work around those, but haven't done that yet. And uh, there are also problems with, uh, or at least unaddressed performance issues with um, parallel F syncs on the same file, because we could get some performance improvements there if you use something like uh, the commit waiters. Then there are some features that are missing. So uh, support for native encryption would be a must, I think, if we upstream this. Um, or if we consider something like this upstream and uh, mirroring uh, of PMEM so that we get some redundancy for this log uh, that is also not implemented yet. Also, the glue code is quite hacky, as you might have noticed. So um, there sh we should probably revisit some design decisions there. And more importantly, the design has also some inherent weaknesses. And I would like to thank Alexander Moten specifically for his feedback on this. So the first thing is that it really doesn't address the elephant in the room, which is that the ZIL is very, very sequential and very strict about the guarantees it gives to our user space. And the PMAN provides those same guarantees. But if we want, but if we were fine with relaxing those guarantees, we could potentially get a lot more performance. And maybe we can discuss this in the breakout room, whether uh, relaxing the guarantees is an option for us. Another aspect is uh, amount of DRAM uh, allocations and DRAM to DRAM copies uh, that are happening in the ZIL. Uh, those don't show up with four kilobytes synchronous writes, but they do show up if you crank it up to 128 kilobytes uh, writes or even higher. Then there is a bunch of mem copies going on that are not really necessary and could be optimized away. Um, we don't have more mem copies than ZIL LWB, but we don't have less either. Uh, also, like there are some maintenance concerns. So if we have uh, if we have this custom space allocation going on uh, in the source substrate, then we need to double think every time we do any tricks with space allocation. So for example, ZPool checkpoint is a candidate where uh, generated some headaches during the design phase. Uh, there is also no graceful fallback mechanism if the slog is full. So if data sets uh, cannot be replayed immediately. This is an actual problem on small uh, persistent memory devices like NVDIMM N. It's not so much a problem on Obtain because the smallest unit for Obtain is 128 gigabytes. Uh, and the last thing is that the Linux DUX APIs are GPL only, so we cannot actually use those APIs in the ZFS module upstream unless you set the meta license to GPL. I'm happy, to dis I'm happy to discuss ways how we can deal with this uh, in the breakout room. And with that, uh, I'm done with the talk. Um, regarding upstreaming, the PR is out. I've done my best to break uh, the, the, the changes up into commits that can be reviewed independently. Regarding my personal commitment to all of this, as I said, um, that is all content from my master's thesis and my employer is not involved with any of this at this point. So. Currently, I'm only able to contribute to this in my spare time, but I'm quite eager to explain stuff to people and help if there's any interest in uh, upstreaming some of the work. So uh, yeah, thanks for your attention, and I'm looking forward to discussions in the breakout room. Uh, would it be possible to do this in a meta slab instead of a VDEV, conceivably? Uh, what is this question? Specifically? Like put, to put the, so like, if you had a pool which was a single VDEV pool and you didn't want to have a slog, but that pool was on a very fast storage device, could we do some of these optimizations, but within a region of the of the pool rather than yeah. Yes. in a slog? We have this optimist, like upstream ZFS has the like dedicated Metaslob, Metaslab allocation class right now. So like, in theory, like we should be able to change this so that we pre-allocate space from any VDEV. That should work. The, like the problem is it needs to be directly addressable. So essentially we would need to like do the do large allocations like spa max block size allocations. And then we'd need some way to ask given this block pointer to this spa max block size allocation, please give me the the, uh, the 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 memory mapping if we if we want to do this for PMEM, right so yeah at some point we need to bypass the IO pipeline if we do we implement an alternative scheme for NVMe then things might be simpler but at some like we need broad hardware address 
whether that is a virtual memory mapping for PMEM or the NVMe logical block addresses. Right, for the logical block addresses, that sounds a lot like the crash dump to Zvols or swap where, you know, we kind of yeah. allocate all the space and we can just say you, you're you just allowed to go scribble on this part of the disk and go around the, the rest of the pipeline. Yeah, it's going to be the same, same problem that needs to be solved. Or is it solved? No, I wasn't aware. Like, I, I know FreeBSD has something like that, but I don't think... I know Illumos has crash dumps working, right? Ah. Well, Illumos has something like that, but uh, I think not on other platforms.